Okay, welcome everyone to the uh, June meeting of the Hadley School Committee. Um, we are expecting Paul Pfeiffer and not expecting Ethan Percy. So we should have four out of five in just a moment. But in the meantime, welcome Tara and Christine. Um, Annie, any changes to the agenda? Uh, you're seeing it on your agenda, but I did remove the review of the preschool handbook. Miss Winner can't be with us this evening, so we'll present that when she's available, probably in July. Okay, terrific. Thank you. And I'm sorry, the other adjustments to the agenda, these adjustments are always shaded in yellow. Remember, the agenda is live, but yellow means that they were they were added to the agenda after it was posted over at Town Hall. Those shaded items do include uh, item 4 uh uh, 4J, change of a job title, item 4K, approval of a job description, and item 4M, a request for uh, to utilize vacation during the summer. Terrific, thank you. Okay, so um, we're gonna start with public comment. Um, and as a reminder, uh, public comments are limited to three minutes uh, and um, we may or may not have a chance to respond to those items, um, but uh, we, uh, are going to kick it off by uh, having participants raise their digital hand uh, if they're interested in making a comment. And actually, I don't see any um, members of the public in the group, uh, in the Zoom meeting, but I'll just give it a moment in case anyone has a comment to make. Okay, no commenters tonight. Thank you. Um, moving on to presentation and discussion items, we're going to start with item A, Superintendent Summative Evaluation. Annie, do you want to okay. start us off? Sure. So, uh, as you know, and Chris, you're familiar with this from being a teacher, but now uh, you're on the other side of this. So, uh, the school committee is required to evaluate me, provide me the formative evaluation, mid-year, and a summative evaluation at the end of the year. The formative evaluation mid-year is essentially just a check-in. At the end of the year, the school committee is required to rate me on each standard and then provide a summative overall rating. And those ratings are then submitted to the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education. What I provided for you is a document that uh, the link that says evaluation um, and what that takes you through on the first page, it just reminds you of what we're supposed to be doing here, what you need to do. Provide a rating in each standard and an overall rating. I've also provided you with the summative ratings for last school year, um, the overall rating and the rating in each standard from last school year. Um, and then my progress report that I put together. And in that progress report, the I, the comments in bold are me providing you an update on what we've done with each one of these things. As you can see, um, Chris, my goals are the actual standards. So by assessing progress on those goals, the school committee is in effect assessing my performance on the standards. So my goals are the standards, which makes it a little more manageable for the school committee. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I'm happy to answer any questions about the document. I can do whatever uh, the school committee is helpful to the school committee. Well, first, Annie, I have to say, I really appreciate the format that you put it in this time around. Um, I know you've given us updates on each item in the document before, but um, it just seems a little bit uh, very closely. It, it just feels a little bit more clear uh, uh, that our ability to assess you is a lot um, is is made easier by this format so thank you for that and including last year's evaluation um, and I want to say first of all that um, we um, well I personally think you're doing a pretty phenomenal job and um, I um, really appreciated seeing um, as much progress as we've made um, on the instructional leadership side um, and the addition of um, as much grant funding as you've brought to the schools. Um, I've really appreciated that a lot of your 
items here are rooted in surveying educators for their feedback, as well as students and families, um, and to the extent possible that you've reached out and um, worked with outside partners who could complement our own capacity, given our very small school. So your work with uh, consultants and other um, organizations. Um, and I would like to just um, put out there my own feedback on your uh, performance. I think um, it's exemplary um, in most every category. And I would say that um, the standard three family and community engagement in particular, um, as we look at the great progress made this year through open houses and um, world fair type um, uh, events, um, I think that there's probably still work to do. I'm really glad that we're surveying families to get feedback. And I'm really glad that we've, we have the school council thinking about the same kinds of things that, you know, we, uh, you know, um, really honing them into a strategic objective that is aligned with our, um, our um, school committee's um, uh, strategic interests. I would say that that is like on track to be exemplary, but probably still proficient. Um, and so I'll just start by putting out my own feedback there. And, and that would yield an overall rating of exemplary, of course, but still um, asking that we um, get even better at family and community engagement. Um, I'd love to ask for Tara and Christine's perspective as well. Um, so just Right off the bat, I, I agree, um, Hugh Mara, with everything that you said, um, overall exemplary, and I agree with um, proficient on family and community engagement, but I do, you know, I, I think it's important as you did um, to point out how much improvement just this year alone we've had. And it's almost an unfair category in my opinion um, because it's a hard thing to accomplish. Like how can you become exemplary in this area where I feel like there's always room to grow in how you communicate with the community and how you engage in the community. And it might be changing, you know, the way that, the way that you communicate and the needs of families um, and students is always changing. So I always feel like even though every area has room to grow, this one is particularly challenging um, to really mm -hmm. just say, that's it. We've done a, a, a great job. Um, so, but, but I love reading through just the changes that we've had this year alone. And one of them just being feedback from parents um, after, you know, the, the open houses. I think that that went really well. And it felt like, you know, not something that, you know, families kind of just zoomed through and met, but it became kind of like a community gathering and people hung out and kids at the elementary school, I didn't go to the high school, um, but at the elementary school kids were playing kickball, there was music and families were socializing and it, it became much more of a social event. Um, and so I find that like a really huge success. I almost wish there was something in between proficient and exemplary there <laughs> because I feel like it's better than proficient. Um, but there's always room to improve. Um, and then, hold on, I have my other screen open. Um, I did, you know, that first, that first category that you also touched on, um, Humera, instructional leadership, um, you know, in, in, in particular, I, I feel like, I feel like our administration and you, you being the leader of that, Annie, is really good at getting feedback, feedback from families, feedback from students, particularly at the high school level, and feedback from staff. Um, and more importantly, you don't just get that feedback, you, you do something with it. And that's where this shows in here. Um, I feel like even just thinking about going through negotiations this year, um, there was some serious headway hearing where staff felt they needed um, you know, changes and what they needed for changes. Um, and administration um, was really able to make it work and put it into play. Um, and hopefully next year, it, it makes it something that is more manageable for staff and 
you know, increases their satisfaction and makes their day more manageable. So, um, you know, I, I think it's important just to point out that, you know, not only are these things done, but you seek input from others and you value their input um, from all parties, all stakeholders involved, you know, and you listen. Um, and I hear a lot of that feedback from, from parents as well. You listen and they're always so surprised when they get a response from you and a response so quickly um, or that you knew who they were or, you know, those are all really positive things. So I agree with the overall exemplary. Thank you. Christine. Of course, I reiterate what, you know, what both of you said. Um, in, terms, in terms of communication with the community, again, we've just come off of some seriously unprecedented times. So the fact that what we seem to have pulled it off smoothly that um, the community seems to have appreciated all the work that you've done, I think says a lot. Um, and I, I think that as a, as a school administrator, you're very accessible and people enjoy that. They enjoy that you take an, you know, a personal interest. It's not the same as, you know, a lot of, I mean, larger systems, larger towns. I mean, people, people find it uh, intimidating to approach administration. Uh, and I've never, you know, people feel very comfortable um, in communicating with you, the, the newsletters. I mean, you've worked very hard to uh, connect with the community. So I, I think, you know, Annie knows how I feel. I, I, I think she's doing a wonderful job. So thank, I want to thank all of you for your feedback. That's, uh, I appreciate it deeply and it's extremely generous. Uh, I, I agree, like the work in family and community engagement is never done. I'm grateful for the school committee for helping me with that. Uh, Chris, I know you're really enthusiastic to, to try to do some work in that space. Humera, the idea uh, about the, the community fair last year. Um, Tara, Ethan, and Paul always like getting that information to me from members of the community, but there always is room. I, I don't know that I would ever be satisfied uh, with that because there's always more. And I, I, don't, I don't engage every group equally well. And I, I'm keenly aware of that and I aspire to do that, but I just know that's not the case right now. Um, so thank you for your feedback. I appreciate it. And I, I want to be very clear that what a superintendent, I believe the job of the superintendent is to create the conditions where talented people is can do, I'm sorry, I'm at school committee. Oh, that's um, okay. uh, so, sorry, someone's leaving the office. <laughs> um, where talented people can do good work, where you recruit and retain talent. So fostering those conditions means making sure people have the resources to do the work well, that they feel that they have room to express their ideas and act upon those ideas. And this isn't, I'm not being disingenuous when I say this. Everything that on this summary, I promise you anything on that summary that made you go, wow, I can't believe we did that. I assure you that that was the work of teachers collectively and individually, your building principals, this director of special education and our new SEL MTSS coach. So I really am the recorder of other people's work. I will say I get a lot of grants, which sometimes helps with that work. But, um, and so I, I, I just want to make sure that credit goes where credit is due. I appreciate the kind things you've said about me, but it's, um, it's simply creating the conditions where very talented people do really good work. So thank you for that. Um, you do need to vote on okay. the standards and the overall rating. Terrific. Um, and please do extend our thanks to your extraordinary team. Um, we recognize that you've assembled an incredible um, uh, cast of characters who is extraordinarily competent at their jobs and that you are an incredible mentor to them. And, um, and that is, um, is demonstrated by the consistently high praise that you get from um, 
a whole stakeholders, including us. So thank you again for all of your hard work and dedication to us. Um, do I hear a motion for um, a an overall rating of exemplary? Um, any does, do we need to spell out the individual so standards? I think it's, you said standards one, two, and four exemplary and standard three proficient. Is that correct? Correct, so that's right. Um, so a motion for overall rating of exemplary and a standard one, two, and four rating of ex exemplary and standard three rating of proficient um, and getting there, <laughs> almost there. Um, do I hear a motion? I'll move. Oh, go and, ahead. A second. Okay. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All right. Thank you. Motion passes. Moving on to the second item on the agenda, facilities audit and capital plan update. Yes, this is an update, not an action item. We met with the reps from Collier's. I think this predates uh, your time on the school committee, Chris. So uh, Collier's came out and did a facilities audit uh, and we met with them because the, our next uh, question is, so what are the next steps? They are sending us a proposal to be owner's project manager for they'll send us a proposal that to be the OPM that would help us a do the timeline like a 10 year timeline which projects in which order and then once the school committee were to, if you when you agree to their proposed timeline uh, suggested approach the OPM would be responsible for doing all the bids writing the bids opening the bids um, and taking care of overseeing on your behalf on our behalf the work that is being done. So I anticipate that we should have a proposal from them in July. And depending on what that proposal is, we may then have to go out and seek other proposals and quotes, depending on the cost associated with that. But we'll see what comes in and I'll share it with you in July. Great. Um, Annie, I have a quick question on that. Does their proposal include the um, any uh, advice or counsel they might provide for as we apply for MS? Uh, BC um, yes. grants. Yes it, does. yes, it does. So one of the people on the call, Chris and I were on the call together. And one of the gentlemen on the call is kind of, that's his specialty at Collier's Wonderful. is liaising with the MSBA. So, um, and with that in mind, they're also keenly aware of when we were last funded, what things were likely to get funded for. So that's part of what the OPM does. Yeah. Terrific. And do you need a uh, that you don't need a vote for no, that. It's just, update. just updating you because I know you folks, for good reason, we're saying, okay, now what next? We saw a facilities audit, what next? So when the proposal comes through, you'll get a copy of it. Glad to see that's moving forward. Okay, item C, breakfast, lunch, price proposal, fiscal year 23 presentation. And that is Chris. Chris, my friend, I think you're co-hosted. There he that is. That is me. Hi, Chris, <laughs> welcome. Hi, thank you. Um, so yeah, you had... Um, a copy of this included in your meeting package. I'm just frantically trying to open it up myself here. Um, let's see, lunch proposal. So um, basically we're, we're required to charge a certain amount for these meals. That's in the first column with minimum allowed. Um, the next column is the current price that we're charging and the proposed price in the end is what we were looking for in terms of um, increasing the price to to bring us to basically um where the where the cost of the meals actually are so we weren't losing money on the meals um the two adult meals basically include um meals tax on that um, without meals tax it would be you know roughly seven percent less um, than what that is so not a huge amount of money but what that does is it puts us you know right in the ballpark of um of covering the cost plus the meals tax. And we also uh, tried to make it where we weren't having a price like $1.64 um, because what a disaster that is quite honestly for everybody to charge $1.64 for lunch um, or you know, two seventy three dollars for the adults. And it would be two seventy three dollars for a minimum amount plus the sales tax, which would put it, I think it was $2.90 something cents. Um, so we rounded it to $3 just to also make life easier for both the people in the uh, food services department and for the, the students and the parents who are paying for it as well. 
I don't um, know if anyone has any me. questions on this. I can certainly answer yeah. them. Um, I don't have any questions. Um, Tara and Christine, um, questions from you? I don't have any questions. Okay. Um, I, I we it, uh, the original prices are really really low, and um, you know with inflation it makes sense that we are going higher. And there's still when you look at you know three dollars for um, or three dollars and fifty cents for lunch, you still really can't beat it relative to other things on the marketplace. So I I, I definitely feel like this is um, although it feels like a jump relative to where we are today, it's still pretty low relative to marketplace prices for food, I think. Um, and um, I, I really appreciate the rounding up um, or at least the rounding to the whole dollar. Um, I wonder just before moving forward with the motion, does rounding to the nearest dollar for most of them, except for the 350 I see, uh, the student lunch item. Um, does that is that something we would have ordinarily done, or would we have gone up in quarter increments historically? That's what I I recall from past lunch updates, and I wonder whether by going this whole dollar amount, whether we might be stabilized there for a while. Um, well, in terms of the whole dollar, I think the only one that really um, would apply there would be the student breakfast, where we. I suppose could have gone to 175 instead of the $2. Um, the $2 was actually kind of a decrease from what uh, our food services director had requested based on current pricing. So that's why we brought it to the $2. Um, the actual meal price is actually a little bit higher than that, um, but we kind of pulled it back so as to not have a, a large increase in the cost. Um, the other ones, the adult meals certainly rounding to the, the dollars just made sense because again, you know, with $2 and 90 something cents with tax for the breakfast. And, and it was again, pushing $5 um, with tax again, um, you know, for the adult lunch, we just thought it made sense to do that. But really the breakfast was the only one where I guess we jumped up from a 25 cent increment um, to bring it up to a, a round dollar amount. Um one quick question. Nothing has changed in terms of, because obviously I haven't been there in a while, but nothing's changed in terms of what they get for lunch or does, do they still have the salad bar and all the other, so everything's still the same in terms of what they're getting for their lunch. So that's okay. correct. Yeah. Okay. And I'm just curious about this, um, this uh, the dis the difference between the student lunch pricing and the adult lunch pricing does it mean a different qu quantity or is it just a different tiered pricing? I do believe that the adult meals are slightly larger than the kids meals. I've never gotten one myself, so I don't know. Um, but I I think I was told that that was the case. They get a little bit more um, than the average student meal does, so um, it it's a little bit higher. The other part of that, of course, is that a lot of the, the costs of the student meals are subsidized by the government. We can't subsidize the adult meals. Um, that's, that's kind of a convenience offering for the faculty rather than, you know, something that we, we have to provide more or less. That's right. That's, I forgot about that point. Okay, terrific. Um, so would someone like to make a motion to approve this um, proposed pricing? I'll make a motion. Great. Second it. Okay, all in favor? Aye. 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 And the motion passes. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. All right, um, moving to item D, return funds to town reimbursement for COVID absence covered by, with ESSER funds. Yes, so you already agreed to do this. What we have to do tonight is the amount, the state program that reimbursed the town for COVID-related absences for employees ended uh, beginning mid-March. We've had people who had COVID-related absences and uh, as a one to help our employees, and it was a legitimate use of our grant funding through ESSER 
and in turn then to help the town, we said that we would use ESSER funds to reimburse those absences. And the amount, which you have to approve the amount tonight that we will then return to the town is $23,581. Okay. Um, do I hear a motion to approve uh, the spending of $23,581 of ESSER funds to cover COVID related absences? So moved. And all right, all in favor? Aye. Aye. All right, motion passes. Moving to the next item, item E, second and final reading of policy KF building use. Um, this is something that we've seen um, actually over the last two meetings, heard about in the two meetings ago and, and presented to you last meeting. Um, and the only items that have changed, um, and Tara, I'll call on you um, for this. There's two items that changed. Yeah, so we added um, in the examples for the descriptions of um, nonprofit, Hadley Youth Organizations, parent school programs, and other youth activities, we've um, called out in the examples to use Cal Ripken um, in addition to other things listed. Um, and, and these are just examples. This is not an exclusive um, list. Um, and then the other thing that was changed was um, hours. Six or seven. Yeah. Okay. So custodial fees, we've removed the um, hours listed um, and changed it just to designate during normal staffing hours. And those are the only two changes. Great. Thank you. Do I hear a motion to approve policy KF building use? So make a motion. Seconded. <laughs> Terrific. Um, all in favor? Aye. Aye. All right. Motion passes. Moving on to item F, sale of used textbooks. Textbooks. Annie. Uh, it's actually Chris, you're back up. He's handling this one. Unless, are you there, Chris? There he is. He's here. He's just waiting for things to kick back on. All right. Um, so the textbooks. Yes, we have a number of textbooks at the elementary school. Um, I'm looking at a list here. It looks like around 160 of them um, that are no longer being used. And so they were looking to dispose of these books uh, in two ways. Number one would be to um, offer them back to the publisher and see what we could get for them. And the other, and, and you know, anything that the publisher would be interested in, obviously, uh, we'd receive the funds for them. And the funds would go back to the town because these are all items that were purchased in prior years. And um, then, you know, whatever they had no interest in, well, we would just dispose of. They would, um, they would be recycled because um, our trash pickups do recycle items like this. So they would be disposed of in a proper manner. Um, but we need your approval because they are disposal of assets. So we are disposing of them. We're not selling this back to the textbook manufacturer. Anything that they're interested in will sell. They don't want them all. I see. Well, and, you said, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Christine. You said the money goes back to the town or does that go back to the school to purchase or pay for the new, new textbooks, obviously, or additional textbooks? Yeah, it goes back to the town. Anything from a prior fiscal year goes back to the town. We can't keep those funds. And this would be basically something that was bought in a prior fiscal year. So, uh, so yeah, they would get it. And do you need a motion for this, Annie? Okay. Do you hear a motion to um, sell used textbooks um, and and dispense of the textbooks that were, are no longer being used? i moved. Okay. Second. All right. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, motion passes. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Some Item G, acceptance of donations from Fitzgibbons family for DC field trip. Yes, so the school committee always needs to accept donations. That's a school committee policy. Uh, parent fundraising group for the DC trip worked very hard to do a bottle and can fundraiser with a redemption center. And unfortunately it appears that the redemption center was not quite um, as up and up as they had hoped. And we're very appreciative the Fitzgibbons without being asked um, subsequently decided to donate $600. 
for the DC field trip to benefit all families. And the wow. school committee needs to accept a donation. It was incredibly generous, unsolicited and incredibly generous. Very, very generous. Thank you to the Fitzgibbons family. Um, do I hear a motion to accept the donation? So moved. Um, seconded. And all in favor? Aye. Aye. I just have a question and thank you to the Fitzgibbons family for that as well. That's very, very generous. Um, I just wanted to make sure we don't have any students that are finding it a hardship and are unable to participate at this point due to funding. Do we know? No, so the, the field trip has already essentially had, had, uh, has come and gone on this DC field trip, right? This is oh, okay. has already occurred, yeah. So they just um, stepped in to a hole that had been created there. So no, we didn't have one. Yeah. Many thanks to the Fitzgibbons family. Yes. yes, thank you. Okay, moving on to item H, final school year 2022-2023 uh, calendar, Annie. Yeah, you guys have voted on this. This will be your fourth vote. So really it is the final one. I'm thinking <laughs> this is the final one. So the only thing that's changed, I told you that uh, Jen Dowd wanted to speak with her faculty about does it make sense for them also to have that collaboration time? So if you recall, you've already approved and these will be on the same days, which will make it easier for parents to remember. Hopkins Academy would have a one hour delayed start to allow time for teachers and our class and our educational support professionals to collaborate <laughs> together. And now on those same days where the students at Hopkins, all the students ride the bus together. So Hopkins starts at the elementary time, more or less. So you gotta drop off one first than the other. They start roughly an hour later. And then that same day, everybody's dismissed at Hopkins time. So the Gus goes and picks up the elementary students so that the elementary teachers have this collaboration time. And Hadley Kids is aware of that and is prepared to start at um, an hour earlier, essentially at the elementary school to help parents with that as well. Terrific. Annie, I just have one question um, mm -hmm. and that is, will, um, is there a plan in place that the task force is going to prototype alongside this pilot all the mechanisms that we want to to design sort of safe uh, interactions. I think we talked about Promerito um, volunteers or mm -hmm. other strategies. Um, I see that there's one a month, so 10 opportunities to prototype and, and fine tune. Um, we'd love to hear about that at some point. Um, and, I'm, and I'm wondering that that plan is in place, yes? Yes. And um, I am happy to bring to a future school committee meeting um, what that looks like in terms of, so we have talked about having pro Merida students as kind of like ambassadors on the, on the buses too. And then depending, just as we do now, sometimes we may decide that a particular route would benefit from an additional adult. We do that now. Um, so also as soon as uh, Ms. Hoff has done all of the runs and what those look like. That will also factor into the kind of things that we may want to consider to ensure that our bus runs are quiet and, and relaxing and enjoyable. Wonderful. Yes. Great. Thank you. Do you need a vote on this? I do because I hopefully it's the last time I've changed the calendar and then parents at the elementary school were um, well, Terry, you probably got this notice. Parents at the elementary school did receive something from Jen as a heads up because we knew now nobody's going to read an email now saying, guess what? This is happening. So they got it during the school year. It had draft written across it. We'd like to take the draft watermark off and just say, this is a calendar and keep it on the website. All right. Terrific. Um, so do I hear a motion to approve the final school year 2022-2023 calendar? Um, I'll motion to approve. And Annie, I just wanted to add in real quick, though, when we send out that um, um, updated notification to parents um, that this is the official calendar, just letting the parents of the Hadley Kids program know that there will be after school. I know that after the 
email was sent out from Jen, I did hear chatter about like, well, is there going to be after school? What's going to be happening? Um, so just clarity that they parents that do after school those days will still have that um, available to them. Yes. And I motion it. Yes. Thank, Thank you, Tara. All right. All in favor? Aye. 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 All right. Motion passes. Moving on to item I, designation of school committee member for bus driver negotiations. And um, I, Ethan and I volunteered to do this um, when we were discussing school committee, uh, com uh, committee assignments. Um, Annie, what is the action here? There is no action, just an update. So we're waiting. The school committee legal counsel is in contact with the uh, representative from, this is the UPSEU union. This is not the HEA. That's why it's separate negotiations. And, um, and then we'll look to set up a date. But just All right. update folks on where we're at. Terrific, thank you. Moving on to item J, this is the change of the title network administrator to technology director. And uh, it's like a, um, a welcome to this century um, in yes. terms of like, <laughs> I and, imagine and the this is- was... Yeah, the job description yeah. actually aligns with a tech director. So yeah. it's really, that's the only thing that changed is that it's a, it's a tech director, but it is a job description, a school committee approves job description. So I would need school committee approval to make that title change on the job description. Great. Um, are there any questions or comments on this before we motion it? No questions. Okay. All right. Um, do I hear a motion to approve the name change to technology director? So moved. Okay. Seconded. All right, all in favor? Aye. Aye. All right, motion passes. Uh, moving on to item K, approval of job description, SY district cook summer custodian, Annie. Yeah, so the SY is for school year and this is essentially taking two distinct positions and uh, creating one job description. You may see more of these. So the short of this is we have our district cook who's worked in the district for a long time in the cafe, also works as a, in, in the summers is a custodian in our buildings. And that technically uh, would present a problem with the ethics law, which says that even though it's one check and it's one department, oh, okay. you can't have two different jobs. Um, so in order to protect our employees, because these violations rest with the employee, it's not an institutional violation. The employee spoke with the ethics commission and gave them permission to speak to me. And the lawyer at the ethics commission said, if there's one job description, um, you, you can hear in my voice, not all of this makes sense to me. I'm not burdened with the legal education and it doesn't matter if it doesn't make sense to me. But if it is one job description, no longer violates the ethics law. Um, so this is a new position. It's yeah, but do know that I am, and I, I do want this stated publicly. And should anyone have any questions or this ever come up with the school committee's attorney, we are thinking through every single place where this is would apply. And so in dribbles and drabs, you're going to see this with our teachers who may, for example, collect money at an, at an athletic event. Um, mm -hmm. We can add in our unit A and unit D contracts, we can add a line, you know, school committee has to sign that, the union has to sign it, that would protect the employees. For people who aren't in unions that might work in the summer, collect money at an athletic event, you may see more of these because we certainly don't want to prevent people who are trying to earn extra money in-house from those opportunities. So that's what this is and that's why you're seeing it. In fact, we should make sure they have every opportunity to supplement their income with additional opportunities. So whatever it takes to make it legally sound, um, even if it is a um, job description that seems kind of quirky, being mm -hmm. a cook and a custodian at once. Mm -hmm. um, any comment from my colleagues on this? Uh, no, just thank you for right. um, going through this and ensuring that the employees are well taken care of, I guess. So thank you for your attention to it. Indeed. All right. And do I hear a motion to approve this new job description? 
I make a motion. Okay. Seconded. Right. All in favor? Aye. 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 All right. Motion passes. Moving on to item L, reclaiming focus, increasing attention and engagement and redu reducing distraction. Um, HA staff feedback. Annie. So tonight I just want to let you know what we're thinking about and considering. And what I'm really looking for here is um, input around when it uh, when you think it makes sense to try to schedule a parent Q&A. There are a lot of links in there. So one of them, the increasing focus link, um, takes you to a excerpt from the book, Stolen Focus. Stolen Focus is a book that all the administrators are reading. Uh, a handful of teachers at Hopkins, I know, have started reading it. This is an excerpt from that book. Um, and uh, we've been asking ourselves, we've noticed, we've certainly noticed even more so this year, which probably makes sense because students spent a lot of time, uh, more time at home or on devices. They needed these devices in many cases to communicate with one another during the pandemic. So what we've seen is we observe a, in some cases, a tremendous amount of dysregulation that ensues when students are checking social media during the day or they're texting or getting texts or having these experiences that really disrupt their ability to attend to the task at hand, which is be in school. Um, and this is not, I really want to underscore this. So what, what, what we are asking ourselves is, is there anything we can do in our environment to make it easier to support students in trying to focus attend to the task that is in front of them, to pay attention to the people who are in front of them, to what is happening in real time. What can we do to help them do that? Um, we also noticed that even students, so, so, so when asking that question, what can we do? We started looking at various resources. Stolen Focus is one resource. I've also included some of the research around it's, and it's very preliminary and nascent, but some of the preliminary research around, and, and I really want to underscore, it's not conclusive. So I'm not coming in here pushing a position, um, but uh, there's enough research to say that these devices may in fact, and how we interact with these devices, it isn't just phones, it isn't just social media, it's about multiple tabs open on a screen, uh, starting to email, coming back to email, it's about interruptions. There's enough research out there to say, this is worth paying attention to and doing more research. And so we said, is there anything that we can do to make things better for students? And even students who don't become visibly and observably dysregulated during the day, uh, staff will report, and, and I can see it, that it's like there's there's always the, every muscle fiber and ear is kind of leaning toward waiting for that thing to buzz or that wristwatch to get my attention or something to get my attention. So we looked at what Chicopee Public Schools did last year and um, also what some districts around us are considering right now and they're beginning to talk with their school committees, which is using the companies called Yonder, but using these pouches that students essentially are issued a pouch. The pouch has a magnetic closure. So it's not that it's impossible to get to the phone, but you would damage the pouch if you did that. It would be clear that you had done that. Students enter um, the school. They get a pouch that they've decorated. It's their pouch. They place their phone in the pouch. There are pouches that are large enough to take phones and smartwatches and earbuds. Also, I believe that you can put the phone in the pouch and by putting the phone in the pouch, it stops communicating if you have a smart wristwatch, right? It's all about reducing interruptions. Um, and so the students then place their device in the pouch. They seal the pouch, there's like a magnetic scanner. They put it in their backpack, they go about the day. Chicopee uses staff in the morning, tables are set out. Kind of they're very neatly, you know where to get your pouch, you do this, you go out about your business. At the end of the day, there's almost like a scanner, you scan the pouch and it opens the pouch up. You take out your devices again. 
Um, so this is something, the aside from the resources, the HA staff feedback, you can see how the staff felt about this. They're overwhelmingly in support of this. They certainly, there was good discussion and questions. I really want to underscore that this is not about, um, for me, this isn't about punishment. I mean, I can imagine some people might say, well, just, just punish the kids who use their phone in school. They're not supposed to use them anyways. Just punish the ones who use their phone in school. And for me personally, this isn't about this at all. I'm worried about the young people. I'm worried about the adults in this district. I can't tell you how many times, it, not just in school, everywhere I go, that a person cannot have a conversation with me, sustain eye contact without turning to some device, attempting to quietly type while they're also talking, without tapping their wrist, without grabbing their phone. Um, and if in fact, any of this preliminary research, if the concerns laid out in stolen focus, if even only some of those turn out to be true, it's enough for me to say, I mean, I just feel so strongly, I owe it to the students in this district that they get a reprieve from that. I owe it to them to create conditions where there isn't this corrosive sustained attack on their attention. I just feel really strongly about that. And one final anecdote, I uh, chaperoned a, a field trip and a Hopkins student was in my car when we went to UMass. And when I talked about this concept and I shared with the student this, I was reading the book Stolen Focus. And I said, you know, I wonder, Again, this is one student, but it just struck me. I said, I really wonder if in 10 or 20 years, you guys, meaning the students here at Hopkins now, if you guys won't be looking at me the way sometimes I look at my parents' generation, because when I was filling my gas tank as a teenager, it was with leaded gasoline. And now I wonder, like, who thought that was a good idea, right? <laughs> but and I wonder, like, where were the adults in that? I said, I wonder if you guys are going to look at us and um, ask yourselves, where were the adults when I couldn't put this phone down? Without missing a beat, the kids said, absolutely. So we'd like to explore it and I'd like to have a Q&A with parents about it. And I'm, uh, so this is more not like a vote here. It's more, again, asking around the Q&A if it's something we'd like to do as part of a school committee meeting um, or something separate and um, and then I'm just open to any concerns or feedback or thoughts folks might have. Annie, first, I really wanna thank you for taking this issue up and um, in a very thoughtful way, um, looking at all the issues. There's a lot of science about cell phones and the impact of social media in particular on young teenage brains. And um, I think this is a great conversation to have with um, the community with parents. Um, I, um, and I would, I would have to say that I'm probably a, I'm, I've come full circle on this myself personally, where I was a big proponent. I am a big proponent of technology and the use of technology and getting our students technology savvy and not shying away from giving them, um, real world experiences in today's environment. And that is being able to use a phone responsibly. But I think that even adults need some nudging about how to put it down, how to not let the not not let it become a distraction to the very present opportunities to connect with people in front of you and to to learn deeply. So um, I'm really excited that you're starting this conversation. I would welcome it to be in a school committee meeting. I think it would be nice to have an option, a school committee meeting and maybe one other touch point where someone might not be comfortable in a school committee setting, um, coming out and, and speaking um, their truth. Maybe it's a, an open forum, perhaps no one would attend, I don't know, but, um, Maybe it's a separate Zoom call. Perhaps it's a like a month that you make yourself available for comment through your newsletter and people feel free to connect with you. Um, I welcome others to comment. Tara, Christine, other thoughts on this? Uh, I mean, I've, I've obviously watched 
you know, I started teaching really before, I mean, we had flip phones, that was about it, or we had those little tiny ones, nothing like we have now. And you can see as you're teaching, especially, you know, um, if there's something going on, if there's some, uh, I'll, I'll use the Johnny Depp, Amber Heard thing that all the kids were enthralled with. It's, it's if they're not paying attention because they're waiting to get into the hall to find out what happens. They're not, they're not, you know, consciously aware that their attention is elsewhere because they're still, they're present. They're not looking at their phone. They're looking at you, but their mind is somewhere else. And it's because they have it there to go run and look at. Um, and I, I think you know, sometimes we ask a lot of our students uh, in terms of, you know, the they, they don't necessarily always have the, the maturity to go along with the technology that we're entrusting to them. And so I think that it's worth, it's definitely worth trying. If it doesn't work, it doesn't work. But I think we owe it to them to try to see if this doesn't increase um, their awareness of what's going on around them. And even, they, you know, again, some of the students are unaware that they're not thinking or they're not paying attention because they have other things going on. I'd be really curious to see how those students feel, you know, if have their grades gone up, do they feel that they're actually listening better? So I, I think it's a great idea. Tara? Um, so I'm, yeah, I'm very supportive of this. And um, I guess a, a couple of things, um, you know, I, I'm sorry, Nora, no. Um, so um, I like the idea of the public forum and I like the idea of school committee being involved. Um, I think that we've generally had pretty good responses with surveys, even if it's simple questions with an option to do open comments. I do feel like um, sometimes people are more willing to um, put in those comments um, into those surveys. I apologize. She's don't worry. It's not. Here. It's not at all distracting. Um, Toddler in the so, background. I'm just so glad she's not on a phone. Yeah, so that's right. all I care about. I know. Thank you. <laughs> um, and so I know. And here I am saying I'm trying to get her on the technology. Sure, stop. She'll do it more if I tell her to stop, I'm sorry. Um, so I think that parents sometimes can feel more comfortable because oftentimes I've noticed that parents can be pretty outspoken in the surveys um, and seem pretty comfortable and maybe a little bit more reserved in the forum. So I like the idea of two different options of ways to respond. Um, and I, I, I think that that might be a good way to get that open communication rather than just Annie being available for a month's time. I think maybe just funneling that through a survey might be a good idea idea. Yeah, um, yeah. And, um, you know, another thing just to point out, I think that it's important to recognize that you're not making the suggestion to take away phones and not allow them at school, right? So children still have access to them before and after school because they've become an important necessity mm -hmm. and means for parents to communicate with their children. And so that is recognizable and parents and students still have a way to get in touch with each other during the school day because we have a central office so if there's an emergency parents know how to reach their children um, at the school a phone is just not necessary um, and I think this is important because our kids are growing up in a different time right now than we have grown up um, I mean my two-year-old was basically born knowing how to use an iPad and knowing how to unlock my phone better than my mom's 75 year old husband. Um, and so I think it's really important for us to be the, the good example and, and provide them with the, the, you know, not lesson, but, but the lead by example and having the phones away and it's showing them the importance of paying attention and not having them available to them all the time and that your focus needs to be elsewhere. And I can tell you at a previous job that I worked at, um, there actually had to be a policy put in place around phones because people at a work site, and these are, these are grown adults and professionals, and a policy had to be in place around cell phones um, and that nobody could have their cell phones on them 
because it became a distraction and mistakes were getting made and mm -hmm. um, work productivity decreased all. And again, these are grown adults that wouldn't be able to um, put their phone down for the same reasons Christine laid out. They're too attached to what's going on. They don't want to miss that information or planning what's happening after work or whatnot. Um, so I think it is important. So I'm super supportive and I'm, I'm curious to hear feedback from others on where that goes. I like that idea. I can also include in the survey. So I'll put together a draft of a survey and I think I can have all of you take a gander at it. And I think I can, I'm pretty sure I can. If I can't, I'll ask for a representative to, you know, somebody to do it. I just I'm don't want to violate open meeting. meeting. Yeah, that's the only thing I'm trying to avoid is not accidentally violate open meeting. But so it either I'll send it just to Humera to look at if everybody can, if I can send it to everybody and it doesn't constitute deliberation, I will. And um, yes, so thank you for your support in our exploring this. I, I really just so desperately, um, what I personally observe again is anecdotal and this is not limited to our students. I fear that many, many people have lost the power of choice. It, it's, um, it is an unconscious act to be interrupted by one's wrist, to have a notification on one's phone, to have something chime and something like that. And I just want to give young people back the power of choice. Um, and so uh, I'll keep you posted and I'll minimally get a survey to you, Humira. Perfect. Um, just one more uh, important comment. Um, and that is, they, um, we, we just talked about the fact that it will be available at the start and the end of the day. I also want to point out something really important, which is that it's even available in the middle of the day, although a magnetic part of the pouch would break, it's still available in the case that something urgent were to happen. And our, yeah, we, we, our policies are, we would design policies that were in place to safeguard any exigent circumstances that would require a student to be able to quickly access it's 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 still in their backpack it's not somewhere tucked in a locker like some schools have it it's on their person and so um for that reason i really like this um this uh particular offering that you've shared this company that chickapee uses so thank you for that and and i couldn't agree with you more one school committee of discussion inviting people as well as a survey but the survey i would imagine would be the primary means to get that feedback. So thank you. You don't need anything for us from us. In no, terms of just voting. wanted, um, you know, folks, uh, you may start hearing from folks in the community with questions about it. I think you have certainly enough resources and people can access the website. They can look at some of those resources and understanding uh, everything you laid out still on their person. When we have at one of those, hopefully the school committee meeting, the chief or Lieutenant Cook or Sergeant Romano might be available then to specifically speak to um, concerns about uh, safety and their perception about that. So, Terrific. great. All right. And we're on to the last item, request for administrators to carry unused vacation through the summer. Annie. Yes, yeah, so just asking that, which is pretty standard for just about every employee here that's that earns vacation time. So uh, non-union employees to be able to use their uh, vacation time into the summer, even though we enter a new fiscal year on July 1. So I'm asking that um, that that accrued and unused vacation, we have an agreement around that, that that's just extended out for the summer so that the administrators could use that time during the summer when it's much easier to take time than during the school year. Terrific. Um, and that does not require a vote, does it? Actually, it does I, I would request that, yeah. Yeah, I'd just like your approval. Before. Okay. So do I hear um, any comments on this first before we motion to vote? Tara, Christine? No okay. Concerns. Okay. Um, this is a motion to um, request administrators to carry unused vacation through the summer. Do I hear a motion? So moved. And a yes. second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All right, motion passes. 
Now we're on to business manager reports. Chris, are you with us? I am. Um, and I was listening to your conversation about the phone thing. I actually have one of those pouches here. Um, we were discussing it at our school committee meeting. And I'll tell you, you cannot open these things. I mean, it's uh, it's pretty strong. We we had a number of people trying to do it the other night. You can't open them without the device. So it's uh, they're pretty secure. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, Great, thank you. So first up, I have the uh, the expense report. Um, looking at the report, you can certainly tell that the year is winding down. Um, we're down to about $18,000 remaining in the budget. Um, that amount is going to fluctuate really for the next couple of weeks. Um, it's up higher than that now, um, but we have a number of expenses yet to go. Um, it all depends on, on how expenses come in how many um, purchase orders that are remaining. A lot of times someone will submit a purchase order and then the prices will change or the order gets canceled. And sometimes that purchase order is still hanging out there and we have to actually reach out to whoever um, you know sent it in or um, often, I know Mike DeBarge, the bookkeeper has been reaching out now to the, um, the vendors themselves and saying, hey, was this order ever placed? Do we have an outstanding bill? Um, so there's a, a lot of movement really between say June 15th and July 15th um, with the budget, but um, it's it's going to be hovering around that $18,000 mark, uh, you know, plus or minus. Uh, we have another payroll as well, um, so that will will hit it. But um, you know, we will be closing the year, um, you know, above zero certainly. So um, there may be a, a small amount of money that goes back to the town. We'll kind of see how it settles out, but. It, it's not going to be a huge amount. It, it, I think last year we gave, if we gave back three hundred seventy-five thousand, I believe it's it's not going to be anywhere near that this year. But um, I can answer any questions anyone has on on the uh, regular budget expenses. Um, I don't have any questions. I see a couple of big outliers related to technology. I'm assuming that's related to uh, pandemic-related technology expenditure. Actually, so I guess that is a question. Chris, do you want to comment on that? Sure. Um, yeah, the, the tech is a combination of um, COVID-related tech expenses that we've seen. And also, um, we brought in uh, Steve, our upcoming tech director. We brought him in at, on a consultant basis. Oh. Um, and he was paid partially from the ESSER II grant and partially out of the regular budget. So um, the overage that you see is, is him um, hitting the regular budget as well as uh, you know we, we bring in consultants regularly um, for the tech sector um, you know, on, on the really elaborate things um, that need to be done. We bring them in to kind of assist us with it. So those are the reasons why they're higher than, uh, than what was budgeted. Great, thank you. Tara, Christine? Nothing from okay. me. No, I'm, no. Okay. Thanks, okay. Chris. Okay. Then we have the grants report. Um, again, uh, winding down, you can see how the amount remaining um, for the most part is, is certainly going down, down even more. Um, that $6.24 has been taken care of since I ran this report. Um, those ESSER, ESSER two and ESSER three grants can be carried over into the next year. So that's the plan as far as those go is to carry it over into the next uh, fiscal year. Um, those two special ed grants, the 240 and the 252, that, those are amounts, um, they're actually called uh, proportionate share and that is to be uh, used in other schools in the town um, if they request use of the funds. Um, and so that's the amount that's remaining. Everything that's ours at this point has been fully spent. So it's just uh, just those amounts that that remain out there. And um, Circuit Breaker, as you know, um, that's a revolving account. We can carry over roughly 160,000. I may have to do just a little tweaking. I need to calculate exactly how much we can carry into next year. It might be say 157,000 or something like that. And I'll do an expense transfer to bring us down to that balance. But it's always good to, to have that kind of uh, 
funds in your back pocket in case a large special ed expense comes into the district. Uh, we can certainly cover it with that. Um, and the last two grants, so the social emotional learning and early college support, um, we will see if there's any other expenses we can transfer to these grants and, uh, and do the transfers by the end of the year. Great, thank you. Um, this may have come up as a suggestion um, last time, but they, it is getting extremely difficult to read, especially the fine print, given the length of the, the number, sheer number of grants that you've been able to secure, your, you and your team, Annie. Um, it may be that we have to go to a second page. As much as I like things on one page, for a quick scan, it just might be that out of practicality, we have to see it on two pages. So just planting the seed there that the time might come as we all get older and get gray hair that we're gonna need to squint to see, to see well, these items. Good news, we start a new fiscal year. And so <laughs> that means you still have ESSER two and ESSER three because they carry over and we've already gotten the $50,000 grant, right? A continuation, but there, so, you're correct, you Mara, we'll make sure it doesn't get too small, but new fiscal year, I gotta get back at it and okay. <laughs> more. The list will shrink? Oh yes, yeah, because they're oh. close all these out and then okay. start again. All right, thank you for that. Sure. And Chris, the uh, revolving account accounts report. Sure, and, and just as an aside, I will keep an eye on this report. It will be smaller to start the year, but as it grows and experience tells me it will, um, I will kind of keep an eye on it and make sure it doesn't get too small. So I'll go to two pages. Great, thank you. Um, and with the revolving accounts report, um, these are all in pretty good shape. Um, you know, lunch is is certainly at a, at a nice high point. Um, that'll cover us. You know, this again was, was kind of, uh, you know, a different year with, um, the free lunches all year, but uh, you know, eventually, well, I, I don't believe, Anne, do you know, I don't think that has been carried over into next year. No, the, there's no free lunch next year to my knowledge. Yeah. So, uh, you know, I would anticipate that that balance will start to drop um, over the course of the year. Um, and the other accounts, you know, student activity, obviously that goes up and down throughout the year, depending on what activities are being paid for. Uh, that may decrease again for June. 30th as we paid for a number of activities this month. Um, and the rest of the accounts are in good shape too. Uh, you know, certainly it's it's a good report to look at because it uh, it just shows that you know there's there's more to the school budget than just the regular budget that you see. You know, there's these other accounts that we manage as well. And it's nice for you to see that you know the balances are there and they're they're healthy balances. Um, I don't know if anyone has any questions on those. No questions um, from me, Christine, Tara. I no? had one question, but not necessarily, I, I guess, kind of sort of related. I know at one point years ago, we were talking kind of about the preschool and its finances and sustainability. And I know we had a really large class this past school year, and I guess maybe it's a question for Lauren um, next month, if I can remember it. Um, do we have enrollment numbers for the preschool yet? Just curious kind of where we stand compared to this past year. Lauren will have exacts for you. And, um, but I will say, I think, I don't know that it's as robust as it is right now, but um, there's still a lot of interest. So I think enrollment is continues to go strong, but she right. can certainly provide the exact numbers. Good. The preschool account has um, taken on more of the burden of the program. We used to have a grant that would pay for a, a good portion of the salaries and that kind of, right. it, it decreased year after year until it finally decreased to zero a couple of years ago. So yeah, it's, it's been taking on more of the burden at this point, but well, you know, we'll keep on it certainly. Great, thank you, Chris, appreciate it. Okay, um, moving on to the next item in the agenda, school committee reports and discussions. Um, finance. So I have nothing to report. I'm not sure there was a meeting, Annie, and I'm hoping that when there is, you'll just give me a quick heads up because I do not have those 
scheduled in my calendar yet. Um, should I have something tentatively scheduled in for now? No, and what I need to remember, and I know Joyce is here when we introduce her, this is 100% on uh, me. Uh, so sometimes we'll get an email, other times it's just about checking the town website to see if one is scheduled, if there's a tri board scheduled or a FinCom scheduled. And I have to remember to go to the town website and do that. But um, Joyce may know when she's introduced and as our new ladies on to the, to the select board, um, Again, not her job, but she may be able to say at a school committee meeting, oh yeah, if you're Marin Annie, you can come oh, up. She's on the line now. Um, might we yeah. ask her to, it might be a good time to ask her to unmute and um, do we need to make her a co-host to do that? She is. No. Oh, okay, terrific. Hi, Joyce, welcome. Oops, she remuted herself. You remuted yourself, Joyce. You were unmuted for a second. And then you remuted. Oh, do I have to ask her to unmute? So she's a co-host. I'm confused. I'm confused by that. Hmm. There she is. Hi, Joyce, we can hear you. Oh, no, I'm not a co-host, that's for sure. <laughs> Hi. Hi Joyce. Oh, good, thank you. I know that on Wednesday, <laughs> I'm have, you were having a special meeting Meeting, but it has nothing to do with tri board. It would have okay. okay. And I can double check to Joyce. Okay. Joyce, I think your connection is spotty, and we heard about half of what you said. And I think what you said was there is a meeting coming up this week, but it has nothing to do with FinCom uh, or finance. Um, well, they're, they're going. They're going to be there, but it only has to do with the water uh, main. Uh, that we're putting in on South Maple Street. So it has nothing to do with any of the other boards. Got it. So, and is, is there a regularity with which that- I'm not um, sure if they're going to have other meet with what stuff, uh, boy, this, let's see, where are we? Can you hear me still? Okay, Touch so- and go, but we can hear you now. Have any Anything scheduled right now? Okay. We don't have anything scheduled with a tri board at this point, but I informed. Okay. Great. Um, Joyce, is there a way to be added to the tri board um, alerts and emails so that we see them coming rather than check the website for it? Yes. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Great. If as soon as we determine that we're going to have a tri board meeting, we'll let you know. Terrific. And maybe it could I'll be. I'll make sure that you know. I'll, Thanks, I'll contact Anne and, and let her. Thank you. Thank you. And um, let's just take a moment to recognize that you are our well ahead. <laughs> school board. Oh. Uh, so select board representative. Thank you for serving as our select board representative. We welcome you and we look forward to seeing you at our monthly meetings. Thank you so much. Um, I just want to say at this point, it has been, you know, I've been on the select board for a number of years and 15 years I did on school committee and I surely have enjoyed working with Anne a few years since she has these very accessible always ready to give an answer. Uh, we love having her join our meeting, so. Thanks, Joyce. Thanks, we're glad you're here. Listen to her evaluate way. Mm -hmm. Say she was a claim that you gave her a real hit to our town. So thank her for being here. Thank you, Joyce. Thanks, Joyce, that means a lot. Thank you. Thanks, Joyce. Uh, when I'm on when I'm on, on these meetings and I have a question, um, cause I did have somebody ask me, is this an okay time just to ask, uh, somebody asked about a master doing our lawns, our, our fields and lawns is after we bought a lawnmower, is there some reason because was it more economical for a master to do that than hire another person to mow and do those things? 
Um, I just wanted to have the right answer for that person without sending them to you. So it's okay, Humera, Chris and I can tackle that and I know. Yes, please, while, while we're all here, we may as well. Okay, um, Chris, I mean, you're probably, no problem. You're probably, uh, the short of it for me and Chris can enhance the details here is that we did evaluate what it would cost in terms of, and also keep in mind with the new fields at Hopkins Academy, this lawn mowing has turned into yes. something. I mean, there's a reason that a master can, can have an entire business around this. So it's, it's labor intensive, yes. it's a lot of time. And so even dedicating yeah. human resource hours, keep in mind, of course, we hire a person. We're also the benefit package that goes towards your OPEB liabilities on the town side. Um, and yeah. so we did evaluate the cost effectiveness and the best use of the personnel that we currently have and freeing them up to actually be inside mm -hmm. the buildings. And we don't have a very large custodial staff. It runs really lean. So um, given that we had these yeah. two intersecting needs, I don't have a lot of staff to do this work and we just expanded the amount of lawn we have to care for the um, logical thing to do. And, and Chris can speak just quickly about the, the price point, including both schools was really a no brainer um, at that point because to do both schools was only nominally more than simply taking care of the Hopkins fields. Yeah, so, it was. Um, so we did, did seek three separate prices for it. And um, you know the, the price to do just the athletic fields, originally we had them doing the athletic fields because they were newly planted and we wanted to make sure that there was no question of, well, you didn't mow the fields uh, you know, enough or you mowed them too much. And, you know, and that's why the grass didn't grow. We wanted to make sure that we were protecting our investment by having you know, the, the people who did the fields also maintain them. Um, and then it, it just happened really that we, as Ann said, we have a limited number of uh, custodians. They're also not easy uh, to find sometimes. I mean, you know, it, it, people talk all the time about labor shortages, and that was one of those where we were just having a difficult time finding people. So we decided Correct. with the price that we got, we'd keep, you know, keep the number of staff that we had, and it was, it was far less than what we would pay to hire a single custodian. Thank you, Chris. I, I assumed that that was, I assumed that that was going to be the answer, but it's always nice for people to hear if they go on to your school committee meeting to know why you, you know, did this procurement of an outside firm to do the uh, lawns and things of that nature. Now, the question is, is that lawnmower, is that available for use for town, <laughs> town use if we need it? I, I don't see why not. I, I saw yeah, Anna's talking about imagine, it. Yeah, I would imagine so. I, I mean, it's yours. <laughs> <laughs> well, so I would imagine it's, so. It's, yes. it's, this school committee. It's ours. So. It's ours. So yeah. 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 I would imagine so. Unless there was I mean, some policy it's, prohibiting it's ours, it. It's yours, really, because it's under yeah. your under your budget, but yeah. Okay. I'm just, you know, again, that would be something somebody would ask me. So I'm just kind of trying to get my answers and that would be it. So as being your liaison, um, you know, anything that you need, please contact me. Um, I, my cell phone is 413-441-5435. Um, you may call me at any time whatsoever to, if you have any questions of us. And I will certainly try to keep you informed about when our tri meetings are, are going to happen. And now I'm going to talk to Carol and to just show we might be so we can all get together prior to September and, and see what we can do. Terrific. Thank you, Joyce. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, moving on to policy. Um, this is Ethan and Christine. Thank you. So we have not had a chance to, to um, meet uh, with uh, Ethan being out of town and um, what the things we have to discuss will probably take, you know, are going to take more than a half an hour. So we need to reschedule a time for that. Yeah. All right. Great. Thank you. 
um, CES, Tara? So I attended my first CES meeting right after um, our meeting last month in May. Um, and it was informative um, and interesting, the first one for sure. They certainly do cover a lot of information. Um, and so I had sent along the um, executive director reports for May and June along, as well as I believe I attached the brochure. A lot of emphasis was placed on this new brochure that they plan on disseminating um, really just to kind of um, provide information clarification and kind of articulate kind of the purpose of CES and what they can provide. Um, so maybe there's less ambiguity about what they do. So uh, it was a really nice presentation. It's a really nice brochure if you haven't looked at it yet. Um, uh, it was quite nice. Um, the other thing that stood out to me um, that I had written down to um, kind of mention and I'll keep track of as more conversations um, happen going forward is that a lot of the focus um, on this next fiscal year is going to be um, put into um, building programming for online learning. Um, so they're going to be building an online learning platform with focuses in particular in ESP training and ELA, ELL trainings. Um, and so they, th this is the very beginning stages. Um, I think they're, you know, they're going to need to, you know, hire a, a specialist to help them build and implement this platform. Um, but I'd be curious to see kind of um, how that might be beneficial to our district as far as ELL trainings and ESP trainings. Um, again, they would be, they would be online learning, which makes it much more accessible, which was, I think, the intent as well. Um, and it's my understanding that they also intend and to work with area districts just to find out where further needs might be um, and any other interests um, that might be out there from districts on what kind of content would be um, useful to have in those learnings. So more to come on that. It was a really interesting um, first meeting. Fortunately, we had um, an eye emergency on the second meeting. Um, so I wasn't able to make it, but I did send along their reports and I'll have a report for next month too. Great, thank you, Tara. Um, I will look out for that brochure and thanks for sending that along. Um, and also great to hear that they have trainings for ELLs mm -hmm. and ESPs. Um, we will be. Yeah. will be, we so will value be. ours and it'll be really nice to invest in their ongoing education and development um, so that they can continue being amazing personnel on our teams. Thanks for that. Um, fields and capital. Um, Paul is not here. Annie, do you know of any updates? Yes, yeah, so you line? can expect for us to have an update on the proposed, the cost estimate from Berkshire Design for phase two. You can expect to see that in July. And, um, and then in July also, as I said, uh, we anticipate having a proposal from Colliers about being owner's project manager for implementing the facilities audit. Great, and do we know when the um, CPA meeting is either in July or August? It's so actually can... in early September, which is why uh, Chris has been in communication with Berkshire Design. We've made it really clear that we wanna get that in front of you, that cost estimate in front of you all in July so that we can prepare the CPA application for August and it's due in early September. Wonderful. Does it make sense to give CPA folks a heads up that we're going to want to meet with them in September? Or um, I, I wonder whether their, their schedule well, ever their, becomes too full? This is their schedule, Humera. Just so you know, okay. the CPA, how they run now is they've already posted. This is your deadline to have this turned in, and this is the meeting we would come to present it. I see. So it's actually their schedule, and anybody who doesn't ask has to show up at the two times. So they've timed it now. To, so they're prepared for town meeting. Awesome. Yeah. Wonderful. I know one year, I don't know how many years ago it was that we missed the date by just a hair. And so it's, I'm really glad that we are um, aiming to make all the deadlines. Um, terrific. Okay. Um, we are at item seven announcements. Um, Christine, Tara, do you have any announcements to make? 
No? Okay. All right. Um, I have just two. Um, first, um, I would like to um, just give a um, sincere and warm um, condolences to um, Kathy Nigella for the loss of um, Stanley Nigella. Stanley, um, in his own right, um, Mr. Nigella was a um, custodian at Hopkins Academy for many, many years. Um, and I can say that I've always um, received warm um, smiles and just uh, really uh, kind, kind gentlemen. Um, he also lived on my street and would often wave as I rode my bike by or walked by. Um, so very sad to hear about his passing and wanted to send Kathy and um, the rest of the family our deepest sympathies. Mm -hmm. um, the other, um, you know, on a totally unrelated note, I wanted to mention that Hadley Learns has some upcoming um, programming coming up. We had a, um, a pride pizza party on my porch for June. Um, we also have a um, July event um, coinciding with the week of Independence Day um, to study and evaluate um, Frederick Douglass's famous 1852 speech um, and an August event where um, we've done this format before where people have the uh, ability to read two uh, one of two books. Um, the first is Heather McGee's The Sum of Us. She's a famous economist who's done some pretty amazing analysis. Um, and the other is His Name is George Floyd, um, One Man's Life and the Struggle for Racial Justice by Robert Samuels and Toulouse Olorunipa. Um, I started reading that book. It is pretty amazing. I highly recommend it. So the idea is people read the book, and then come to um, a Zoom to um, discuss one or the other and hear from others about the other one, the book that they didn't read. Um, so I hope that people attend to learn more. Go to hadleylearns.com and you'll find an RSVP in the events section. Okay, um, that's it for my announcements. Um, I think. We already uh, welcome the select board liaison. Um, we have it an MASC MASS joint conference. Annie, do you want to say if the you link is that? there? If a school committee member or members are interested in attending the conference, please let me know. Okay, terrific. Thank you. And we have some action items in terms of approval of minutes of May twenty third, twenty twenty two. Do I hear a motion? I make a motion. Okay, do I hear a second? All right, all in favor? Aye. 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 Terrific. AP, uh, approval of AP warrants for May 2022. Do I hear a motion? So moved. Okay. Second. All right, and all in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Approval of payroll warrants for May 2022. Do I hear a motion? So moved. All right, do I hear second. a second? All right, all in favor? Aye. 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 All right. Um, Annie, you Everything already received our yeah. summative evaluation. You already have a vote on the breakfast and lunch prices. We already voted on the COVID uh, absences covered by ESSER. We already voted on the generous donation from the Fitzgibbons family. We already voted on the textbooks back to the publisher, um, as well as the policy, KF and KFR as well as the early release days from HES. So I think we are all set there. And the next meeting dates are, um, let's see, it's one actually meeting date, um, July 26th at 5 p.m. for the policy subcommittee and 5.30 for the regular subcommittee. And just to be on notice, as Chris said, uh, some of the things we'll be discussing in policy subcommittee, I will be looking to see, uh, to find a date that Ethan and Chris are available we need longer than 30 minutes. So right. especially there's some athletic policies and we'll want some parent input. And so we'll be looking to schedule the policy meeting separately. So it'll just be school committee at 530. 
So that's okay. on a Tuesday. Just wanted to make sure that that was intentional. No, that's that's not intentional at all. Uh, I only give you four calendars a year. Let me look at my calendar. <laughs> <laughs> and I can't read the one I have. No, so it's supposed to be the 25th. Thank you. Good catch. Oh, good catch. Thank you. Not intentional. Okay, so see everyone back here July 25th at 5.30 for the regular school committee meeting. Perfect. Okay. Terrific. Thank you, everyone. Have All right. Day. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye.